All right, Hare Krishna, everybody. Um, welcome to tonight's Project X event. Um, a really warm welcome to those of you who are tuning in live from Facebook, um, and also those of you who are joining us on the Zoom call tonight. Uh, we feel really fortunate tonight to be hearing from His Grace Mahatma Prabhu um, on the topic of self-esteem. So for, for those of you who don't know, Mahatma Prabhu has been in um, the Hare Krishna ISKCON movement for over 50 years. Um, he's a disciple of, his, of the founder of ISKCON, His Divine Grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami, Srila Prabhupada. Um, and he served the movement in many capacities since um, then. For those of you um, who don't know, Prabhu also does a lot of work developing workshops, social media content, online courses, and even books, which are designed to practically show the many ways Krishna consciousness offers solutions to today's challenges. So for a lot of us who are familiar with Prabhu, we feel really inspired by the way he's able to guide us um, practically in understanding these ancient Vedic texts, which as you know, is what Project X is all about. Um, so thank you so much Prabhu for being with us here tonight. Um, just a little housekeeping before we start. Uh, if you do have any questions at any time during uh, the talk today, please leave them in the chat or you're very welcome to um, message uh, myself or any one of the co-hosts and we will ask your question um, to Prabhu. So I'll hand it over to you now Prabhu so you can begin. Thank you. I'm just gonna, I have some questions here, okay. Mo Vishnu Padaya, Krishna Prasthaya Bhutale, Shimati Bhakti Vedanta Shamiti Namane. Namaste Sharashwati Deve, Gauravani Pacharine, Nirvisesa Sanivari Paschatya Dasatanya. I really wish when I was a young devotee, there was somebody my age telling us anything. The senior devotees when I joined were 29 years old. Those were the oldest. And um, if they had been a devotee two to three years, we were like in awe and reverence that they had been devotees for such a long time. <laughs> so I, I think, you know, a lot of the younger generation thinks, oh, you know, you're so fortunate you had Prabhupada's association, but you're so fortunate because you have a life experience of so many devotees. And I'm, I'm not saying this to brag, I'm just reflecting that, you know, it's something you can feel fortunate about. If you feel unfortunate that you weren't with Prabhupada, you can feel fortunate that you have um, the fortune of being able to hear not only from Prabhupada's disciples, but so many senior devotees. I have some good news for all of you. We are in the process of creating a course on self-esteem. And this course is being developed with a devotee who's a psychologist who has taught self-esteem before she was a devotee. So we're going to make it a, a kind of a Krishna conscious version using spiritual principles along with the principles that she teaches. So that's something that's in the process. So that's exciting because I want to offer that a systematic course to all those who need it. What I think we could accomplish Today, one of the things we could accomplish today is understanding how having low self-esteem is, it can be quite normal or it can be pathological, but in either way, it does affect our Krishna consciousness as do many other emotional or psychological uh, dysfunctions or difficulties or illnesses. So I think it's important to, to understand that. And, and when you understand that and start to see how it is affecting you, it can become a bit of an impetus to do something about it. Because you see, when you see the connection, say this is harming my Krishna consciousness. So I wanna discuss that a little bit. I wanna define what it is. I wanna discuss why it's affecting so many people. And then we'll have some questions and there's some questions here of how to guide this discussion. But first, First, I wanted to talk about low self-esteem as kind of a natural problem that's occurring in today's society because of the pressure to be materially successful, the pressure to be beautiful, the pressure to impress other people with your labels on your clothes, the label on your, the car you drive, etc., etc. This has become 
much more, I think, of a problem than ever, at least in my lifetime. And it's a problem in many ways. It's an ecological problem, for sure. But it becomes a, a psychological problem what, because it causes people to evaluate their self-worth by externals. And this, this can also be within the Hare Krishna movement. You know, what have you accomplished? What is your position? Are you initiated, not initiated? You know, there'd be so many external factors that then translate into considering your self-worth. So we're stuck in this this paradigm in today's society. And it's it wasn't it's not like ISKCON promotes it, but we come into ISKCON and we want, we have a need to be acknowledged and recognized. And so sometimes we gravitate towards services or positions where we'll get recognition, not not even conscious of what we're doing. So I think it's natural. We want to be accepted. We want to be acknowledged. We want to be appreciated. So low self-esteem is not in and, in and of itself a problem. It becomes a problem when it becomes very severe. Like my understanding of psychology is basically we're all mentally ill. By, but it's just slight. So it's not considered a mental illness. Like we, we all, if you know, if you diagnose mental illness, we all have a lot of those diseases, but it's just slight. So it's just normal. You know, do you get jealous? Yes. Do you, do you sometimes feel inadequate or embarrassed because you said something stupid? Of course, we all do. That's natural. But when it, when it becomes, a, uh, becomes too excessive, then it starts to become a problem. And we can dis I want to discuss the problems that it creates, because when you see the problems it creates, then you, you may realize it's more of a problem than I thought. So what is low self-esteem? Low self-esteem is actually the opposite of arrogance. So I guess you, know, you could say, well, if I have a choice between arrogance and low self-esteem, maybe I should choose low self-esteem. Not that, that you have a choice, but. Arrogance is the opposite end of low self-esteem. Low self-esteem means you, you underestimate who you are. You think you're less intelligent, less capable, less attractive, less anything than actually other people perceive you as. It's a perception of yourself as somewhat inadequate. That's not, and that perception is not shared in general by others. It's not objective, it's not objectifiable, it's not actually true, but it's a subjective perception of yourself. Um, I have seen very intelligent people who think they're not intelligent. I have seen very attractive people who think they're not attractive. So low self-esteem is kind of like a, it's a dissonance with reality that you start to see yourself as something different from what you are. It, um, the problem is we tend to act according to our perception of ourselves. So if you're very intelligent, but for some reason you think you're not, it will minimize to some degree your ability to use your intelligence, because you'll think, well, I'm not that intelligent, I can't figure this out. When in fact, you could figure it out. Sometimes you see the opposite. Someone not that intelligent thinks, well, I'm intelligent, I can figure it out, and they do. Have you seen that? And the more intelligent person says, I'm too stupid to figure this out. So that's a simple definition of low self-esteem. Um, where it gets a little more serious is the feeling that I'm not lovable, or it comes in the form of also I'm not worthy of being, of, of good things happening to me. That is a deeper, we could call it a samskar, it's a deeper impression. And, and then when you're in that level, it starts having more pathological consequences. Um, it can go up to the point when it gets really bad that 
God doesn't love me. And then when it gets extremely bad, it goes to the point of what's the use of living because my life has no value. So that's, that's pre-suicide. That's suicide is the point where you think there's no, nobody in the world will care if I'm alive or not. And that's, that's the danger of low self-esteem on the material level. If, if it becomes a, a disease and excessive, it could lead to those thoughts. What's the use of living? And um, I know people like that who just, who feel that way every day and they just say, I'm too chicken to kill myself, but that's how I feel. And most of you I'm looking at, or many of you are women, and most women who become suicidal don't do it. Guys do it more often because they're, that's the male nature, you know, they'll just, they'll just do it. So that's where, that's one of the areas it becomes dangerous. And even if it doesn't go to the level of suicide, if I think that my life is of no value and that even Krishna doesn't care about me, you can understand that your life will be pretty dysfunctional and depressing, right? And again, I want to go back to the point that there's no valid reason to objectify any of that. It's just how we subjectively see ourselves. Okay, so here's, does that all make sense so far? Yeah, I think it's pretty simple. So here, here's another problem, and I think these are all, um, I can't say for sure because I haven't studied it, but from what I can tell, these are more modern problems. You know, there's a word, you've heard the word affluenza? You ever heard, I think there was a book about it, you know, like, these are, oh yeah, I was with, I was, I don't know where I was, but, a mother was with a child, and something happened, and the mother said, you know, some, somebody was frustrated because they were all sold out of something, and the woman got really upset, and the little kid was saying, why is she so upset? And the mother said, oh, these are rich people problems. Like, you know, they couldn't get the, the four, 400 pound Nikes because they were sold out, and they're, you know, really upset. Oh, and she said, oh, these are rich people problems. So there's a, there's a lot of problems that are affecting society because of opu the opulence that we're in the lifestyle we live. So here's another one. And there was a, a question here about I should cover the topic of self-love and it's self-judgment. So here's where it gets tricky in spiritual life because in spiritual life, you're supposed to be aware of your faults, right? And I heard a joke the other day Self-awareness is not always fun. You know, like self, we should, self-awareness, it sounds like, you know, warm and fuzzy, right? Yeah. We should all be self-aware. But the fact is that self-awareness is not always fun, is it? Because when you become aware of yourself, it's like, could be a nightmare, right? So I want to talk about that because it's not really a nightmare. It's only a nightmare based on how you view it. So. I look at myself and I see I am like this and it would be better if I was like that, right? Okay, so let me work on being more like that. No problem. Where does the problem come in? The problem comes in with self-judgment. I am like this, therefore I am bad. As opposed to I am like this, let's work on being like that. I stop with I am like this, therefore I am bad. It's a self-judgment. That's where you run into problems, right? And where it hits the, the, the deepest problem is when I am like this becomes my core identity. So bad then becomes my core identity. And that's where it becomes a serious dysfunction. So let's say I say, Vrinda, you know, you, um, let's say, Vrinda, you sent me something, right? and there were some typos in it. And I said, well, thank you for doing that. There were a few typos. Could you correct them? And then I send it back to you, and then you might feel like, oh, that, you know, I'm such a failure. There were typos. Like, you know, there's always typos in everything, you know. That's why we have proofreaders, you know. But, but Vrinda, you might be thinking, oh, there's something wrong with me. You know, there's typos. I'm so bad. So we start identifying imperfect behavior as a core identity that there's something wrong with us. That's where the problem, that's when the problem starts to become serious, right? 
or uh, Vrinda, you, you go to work or school and someone says something to you, then the connotation is you're not as smart as someone else. Okay, the other person you're not as smart as happens to have an IQ of like 195. So it's understandable. You're, but you kind of take it like, oh, yeah, I'm stupid. That means I'm stupid. What, um, the way we take things has a huge effect on us, and then we process them, and we can process them in a way that that starts to become a core identity, like stupid is my core identity. When the person just said, you're not as smart as that other person, and then it gets interpreted in all these strange ways that starts having negative effects on us. Do you realize, I don't know if you realize this, but do you realize that one thing somebody can tell you can completely mess up your life for the rest of your life if you don't deal with it. If I say, Unki, I think you're really stupid. And you, like, have so much respect for me that you take it seriously, that could actually alter your view of yourself permanently for the rest of your life. It's possible. And the fact is, we have all heard these things growing up, and some of those had a bigger effect on us than others. And you may not realize it, but a lot of that low self-esteem can be a product of, innocent, you know, a friend just innocently, innocently saying something, how could you do that? That was so stupid. And that becomes translated as, I am stupid at the core. I'm a stupid human being. Now, that's more subtle, but, but these are things you could meditate on. What happens from that is when it starts to become a core identity, it forms a belief, and then you act according to that belief, as, as I'm a less a person because I'm stupid, or I'm whatever it is. I'm not beautiful enough. I'm not slim enough. I'm not, you know, whatever enough. Yeah, well, just go back to Godhead. You'll be enough. In this world, you'll always not be enough of something. It doesn't matter. Now, it only matters if you make it matter, right? Yes? Who, you know, who decides whether it matters or not? You decide. Well, why would you want to make a decision that works against you? It doesn't make any sense. And we do it all the time, isn't it? You look in the mirror and you're like, you know, a half a kg too fat. And you walk around, I'm so fat, I hate myself, I can't look in the mirror anymore. Why would you want to do that to yourself? Or vice versa, I'm too thin, I'm a half a kg too thin. Everybody calls me, you know, whatever they call me, skinny or whatever. So your interpretation of that is where the problem comes from. It's not what you are that's the problem, it's how you interpret it, right? I want to tell you my story. I'm very fortunate. I have a very independent nature, and in growing up, I didn't listen to anybody. And I realized that this protected me because I don't even know if anybody said I was smart or stupid or good or bad at anything because I never listened. I never cared what people thought. It's nothing I developed. It's just who I am. So my parents could have said, you're a useless bum. My mother used to joke with me, you're good for nothing, because I was, you know, just a teen, lazy teenager. You're good for nothing, why don't you do something? And I just like, leave me alone, right? But I could have taken it seriously, think, she's right, I'm a good for nothing, I'm a useless person, I'll never become anything. I could have interpreted it that way. And there are kids who do interpret it that way. Their parents are just saying, you know, trying to inspire them to become something. You know, you know you got Bs, but I know you're more intelligent than that. You could get As. And then the interpretation is, something's wrong with me, because I didn't get an A. That's not what they meant. That was your interpretation. But my point is, why would you want to do that to yourself to create interpretations that will drive yourself crazy? That's a question for you to meditate on, because I want to I just want to share this point with you that nobody is causing your low self-esteem. You're causing it by your interpretation. The world isn't doing it to you. Your friends aren't doing it to you. Your parents aren't doing it to you. Ultimately, you're doing it to yourself. So that's an important point to understand. And the next question is, why would you do that to yourself?
It doesn't make any sense. Why, why would you want to create anxiety for yourself, right? Okay, I'm not, maybe, maybe it's true. I don't have a high IQ. But does that mean you're not good at something else that you could utilize in your occupation, in your service, whatever? Of course, everybody's good for something. Everybody's useful for something. And if you're not good at anything, you're good serving people that are good at something. It's not like, does it matter? That's my karma. Okay, you know, my karma in this life is I serve people who would do wonderful things and I'll never become famous. Okay, maybe that's my karma. All right, can I accept that? Is that okay? Huh. I was in, um, where was I? Mexico. Taking a walk. I go to Mexico a lot. And so, in Mexico, they clean the street, right? They still do this, Lakshmi Priya, in Monterey, with the big brooms, they still do it. The street, like in America, probably in London, you have trucks that just wham. We had those when I was a kid, we had them, like 50 years ago. In Mexico, you know, more, I guess it employs more people and whatever. So they sweep. And so we go for a walk every morning in this big park in Mexico City. It's right by the temple. And we always meet these guys sweeping. And um, these people are actually happy. It's amazing. If you talk to them, you see them. They're actually happy, and they're singing, and they're sweeping the floor. And I'm thinking, I'm thinking, if these people were in America, they would not be happy. They would be cursing every American. Oh, look what you've done to me. I ended up as a street sweeper. This is horrible. I don't know why Mexican street sweepers are happy. I really don't. Maybe they make a lot of money. I don't know what it is. Maybe it's like exercise outdoors. Maybe it's Mexican culture. But you, you understand what I'm saying? That, that doesn't make sense. That Mexican is not supposed to be happy. There's something wrong with him. He shouldn't be happy, right? He should be miserable. He should think, I'm a total failure. Look what I'm doing with my life. I'm simply sweeping streets, right? And he's happy. What is it? It's an interpretation. He doesn't feel like I'm worthless because I'm sweeping streets. It's like, I got a job. This is fantastic. And I'm not that smart, but I'm smart enough to sweep a street. And I got a house, a roof over my head, and I've got, I've got beans and rice on my plate. I'm good, right? And tortillas, beans, rice, and tortillas. I'm good, right? And so if you study the world, you will see that what people have and what they do doesn't always correspond to their happiness. It's their interpretation of it, isn't it? Right? So, now, there is one situation which does cause, can likely cause a pathological effect, unless you're like me and don't care what everybody says about you. And that's if you were raised by parents who kept telling you, you're useless, you're stupid, you'll never amount to anything. Now, or worse, and I know people like this, whose parents told them, you were an accident and we didn't want you and you were just a burden on us. Could you imagine being told that growing up? We didn't want you, you were an accident, and you're a burden on us. Um, if you're in a situation like that, for sure you will need help, professional help. It will be rare that you're not affected by that. Maybe if it was me, I would also be affected. I imagine I would be. But if you're that kind of that person like, who cares what you think about me? You know, I am who I am. I'm my own person. I'll be who I am. Okay, you won't be affected. But if you're in an environment where you're constantly, constantly put down, it can become a very, very severe, severe form of low self-esteem. And you would need professional help. Because what happens in that situation, at the very core of your being, you're, is ingrained the belief that your life is of no value. You're actually worthless. So low self-esteem has a little scent of that. But when it becomes disease, a serious disease, then it's like on the deepest level of your psyche, that's how you feel and that's how you function. So it doesn't mean that you have to be raised that way to descend to that level. The way you process your life could cause you to descend to that level. And so, I want to talk a little bit about how it manifests and what we can do, 
to work around it. It, I'll ask you a question. When you show up somewhere, what do you want people to think about you? What do you want them to believe about you? Like, I'm beautiful, I'm smart, I'm funny, I'm talented. Like, what, what do you want people to believe about you? We all, you know, have some, I mean, this is a difficult question, we have to be honest. I'm not gonna ask you, I'm just, this is for you to think. Okay, I'll use an example, right? I want people to think I'm intelligent. Okay. Then the next question is, who specifically is it important for you to convince that you are intelligent? And there's probably somebody, or whatever, that, whatever it is you want to convince them. There's probably somebody, right? Who? Who is that somebody? They're like, oh my God, you got me pinned in a corner. It's, I'm trying to impress so-and-so. Okay, so we use my example of, uh, I don't feel intelligent. Right? And I'm, I'm trying to impress so-and-so. Why would I try to impress so-and-so? Because he's super intelligent, that's why. I'm not trying to impress you know, people that dropped out of high school. I'm trying to impress intelligent people, right? Obviously. Because those intelligent people make me feel even less intelligent, isn't it? You ever felt stupid around really smart people? <laughs> Okay, so I want to impress people that I'm intelligent. Why? Because I don't feel that I'm intelligent. I doubt my intelligence. Does it mean I'm not intelligent? No, it doesn't mean I'm not intelligent. It only means I doubt my intelligence. It has nothing to do with whether I'm intelligent or not. And that's why whenever I'm trying to impress people with something, it's usually something I'm not certain that I possess, and I, and I need to impress people that I have it. And, and that thing that you want to impress people, wouldn't it be great if they told you, hey, Radha, you are so smart, and then you would be like, wow, he made my day. Why? Why? Because when you have low self-esteem, you can't get it from yourself. You can't tell yourself, I'm smart. You need other people to tell you, to believe it. You don't believe yourself. That's the problem. You start depending on other people to give you what you should be giving yourself. You start depending on other people to value yourself because you don't value yourself, right? So if I say, Radha, you are so intelligent, you're like, wow, I feel really good today because I don't think I'm intelligent, right? And um, that's a sign of low self-esteem. You start depending on other people to build you up, rather than um, acknowledging that you are who you are. Now, let's say hypothetically, Radha, you're actually not intelligent. You know, you fell over when you were a kid and you hurt your brain and, you know, but does that really matter? Well, it only matters if you think it matters, right? Like, okay, we're all endowed with a different IQ, right? Some have a higher IQ, some have lower IQ. In the long run, does it really matter? Well, you know, maybe I'm not going to get a job as a, you know, astrophysicist or something. But aside from that, it only matters to the degree that you make it matter. It's like, can Radha, can you be um, not brilliant and be okay with yourself? Yeah. You can. Could you be brilliant and not okay with yourself? Yeah, because you're not as brilliant as Albert Einstein, so you're depressed. It's possible, right? Let's say Radha has a super high IQ, like 150, but she's like, Albert Einstein had 185, so I feel stupid next to him. And everyone's saying, Radha, you are so brilliant. No, I'm not, you know, I'm not that smart. You know, Albert Einstein had 185 or whatever. I only have 150. You know, we'd look at you and think, are you crazy? So it doesn't have to be based on reality. It has, it's only based on your interpretation. Right? What, what, what is success for you? Well, how do you define it? Right? In our society, it's defined success for us. And even if you ask yourself, what's success as a devotee, or what's success in ISKCON, your definition may not be the definition in the scripture. It may not be Prabhupada's definition. It may be really filtered through 
material values or social values or expectations um, or expectations that you believe others have of you. So it's really, I feel it's really important to understand what is Krishna's and Prabhupada's definition of value, of self-esteem, self-worth, self-love, and so forth. Like, like I might say, well, Ambika, you should love yourself. And Ambika might say, how can I love myself? I only have an IQ of 140. You know, I'm like, my God, that's more than I have. No, it's not enough. You know, my father was a, you know, a physicist, and he was like the head of the department of, you know, of, of whatever in, you know, at, at Oxford, you know. And, you know, compared to him, you feel like nothing, right? So that's what we're dealing with. But that's not what Krishna's dealing with. That's not what Prabhupada's dealing with. So I was thinking before class, I was thinking of the verse, Patra Pushpam Pilam Toyam, offer me a leaf, fruit, flower, and water, right? How to offer it with bhakti, with love. If you, if you add love, if you sprinkle love on it, I'll eat it, right? So if you look at Krishna's leela, what impresses Krishna's, Krishna the most? How well the gopis dance and sing? Mm, that's okay, but that's not the real thing, right? Um, how well the coward boys fight or play ball with their bell fruits? That might be okay, but that's not the real thing, you know? What does Krishna care about? And what does any friend care about? What does any lover care about? Affection, isn't it? So when Krishna, you know, like it's so funny to think Krishna would judge us because like Krishna is so good at everything. We'd, we'd never be good enough for him, right? Right? So Krishna doesn't look at you and say, and say, Sham or Sundar, nah, not, not you. I, I, you know, I don't like the way you comb your hair, so, you know, forget you. you know. We can, we do that, and we, we start to think like Krishna's like that, you know. He's not like that. He doesn't see us that way. 18, um, <clears throat> if you need some boost of your self-esteem, read 1864. In 1864, Krishna says, Now Arjuna, I'm like, uh, I just want the best for you because I love you. And you want me to tell you the whole Bhagavad Gita over again? I'll do it. Why? Because I love you so much. You're so dear to me. That's not just Arjuna. That's all of us. Right? So I, I think the most healthy thing we can do is look at ourselves like Krishna looks at us. Like, why don't you see yourself like Krishna looks at us? Now, here's another thing. I was in San Francisco in August of 1970 um, wearing a polyester saffron dhoti. You know, there's no wrinkles in them, and they shine, and they never fade. And every devotee in the temple was wearing a polyester dhoti. And we, wore, we used to wear tops like the sannyasis wear. So we had these beautiful, shiny dhotis, dhoti, and we were all shaved up with sikas. Everyone, you know, in the temple. There was no room in the temple. We filled it up with brahmacharis. I don't know if there are any women could even fit in the temple. There were very few women in the temple then. So there had to be like 100 brahmacharis or so, packed like wall to wall. And Prabhupada came to the door, and he was so happy. Because you can imagine, this was like still very early in the movement. They're only like, I would say, living in the temple, my estimate is maybe like 350 devotees. And about 150 of them were in that temple, or let's say 100. Let's say, let's say a quarter of the movement was in that temple at that point. It was like the quarter of the total population of Iskand was in that temple. And they were newly shaven with tilak. And uh, 
all brahmacharis. And Prabhupada looks at that and he's just relishing it, right? Looking at that, thinking, this is amazing, right? Now, he could have looked at them and said, nah, losers, forget it, get out of here. It's not going to, this movement's not going to work. You're all losers. He could have said that, right? Which is kind of how many of us might have felt about ourselves, right? Yeah, I'm just a loser. Somehow I ended up in the temple, but you know, it's just mercy. <laughs> but uh, I'll probably never be a pure devotee. You ever think like that? Oh, I'll never be a pure devotee. I'll never really. You know, well, why would Krishna care about me anyway? You know, it's like he's got so many friends. He's got so many gopis, like, and I'm just just an ordinary person wallowing away in material life. Why would he care about me? You ever think like that? Why would Krishna ever care about me? You know, like, um, and amazingly, Krishna does, which is so nice. And amazingly, Prabhupada did. And amazingly, Prabhupada encouraged us and had faith in us. And so what I want to share with you is Prabhupada never, ever, ever made us feel like there was something wrong with us. And there was so much wrong with us. At least, <laughs> at least from the position, if you compare us to Brahmacharis and to Gaudiya Mat, there was a lot wrong with us, you know, a lot. And we might have felt there was something wrong with us, but it wasn't because Prabhupada made us feel that way. Prabhupada made us feel quite the opposite. Like, we can become Krishna conscious, despite whatever. You're, you're, you've got your whole life ahead of you. You can do this. So, I was asked to speak about self-love. Self-love is really the cure, or self-compassion is the cure for low self-esteem. Self-love or self-compassion means to accept myself, accept my karma, accept whatever I am as it's okay, this is how I am. You might say, yeah, but I'm not okay. Well, who decides whether you're okay or not? Again, you do, right? Now, from Krishna's point of view, you're okay. You can be more okay. From Prabhupada's point of view, you're okay. You can be more okay. But Prabhupada never made us feel unloved, uncared for. In fact, quite the opposite. He made us feel extremely cared for, extremely valuable, extremely loved. I'll give you an example. Prabhupada used to tell us over and over again that you should perfect your Krishna consciousness in this life, right? Now, if you translate that into the terms of self-care and self-love, which are not terms used often in Krishna consciousness. They sound more like Buddhist terms or psychological terms. And sometimes when you use those terms, some devotees like, um, where's that in the Shastra? And you know, I never heard Prabhupada say that. But think about it. Prabhupada is telling us over and over and over again, take advantage of this opportunity and dedicate your life and go back to Godhead in this lifetime. Isn't that self-care on steroids? You know, take care of yourself so you will go back to Godhead. And I was in a class and Prabhupada said, you do not want to come back in another lifetime. This is going to be so bad and you can do it in this one lifetime. So that's all about caring for yourself. Take care of yourself. And then Prabhupada said, if you don't, you're actually envious of yourself. And envy in Sanskrit sometimes means hatred. Because we think, how could you be envious of yourself? Because you're envious of someone has, who has what you don't want. So at first thought, that doesn't make sense. But when you understand, the word envy um, is also dvesha, which is sometimes used to mean hatred. So self-envy means self-hatred. Now what does self-hatred mean? It means I'm doing something that's not in my own self-interest, right? So at one point in my devotional career, I started meditating on this concept of self-hatred. And I realized that any time I do something which isn't, isn't good for myself, there's some manifestation of self-hatred. And I would ask myself, 
Why doing this? Why do you hate yourself? What's wrong with you? Where did that come from? Get rid of that. Get it out of there. I don't know where it came from. Yeah, fortunately, it wasn't strong, but I realized if I'm going to make a choice and that choice is not in my best interest, there's some kind of self-hatred condition there within me, and I really, I really need to work on that. And so the way I worked on it was through self-acceptance. It's like, obviously, there's people in a better position than I'm in, people who are more capable, more intelligent, more whatever. But that's okay. I'm okay, they're okay, everything's okay. You don't have to make it not okay, because when you make it not okay, you drive yourself insane. Yes, you agree? Yeah. So, self-compassion means to treat yourself in a way that is beneficial for you. Like when you exercise, that's an act of self-compassion. Because it's a lot easier to just sit on the couch, eat potatoes, and watch YouTube, isn't it? It takes very little effort and it's like no pain, right? And, and then you say, okay, I'm getting up off the couch, I'm going to go out and exercise. And you start exercising, oh, this is so hard, oh, it's so austere. But you do it because you're taking compassion on yourself, you're taking care of yourself, you're doing something which is good for yourself, right? So we extend that. Exercise is an option. You eat right, you know, you could eat this, but you say, no, I'm not going to eat that, I'm going to eat this because this is good for me. That's self-compassion. You extend that to so many of your activities, and especially what we're talking about there, extend that to your thoughts. If I'm not going to eat this ice cream tonight because it's bad for me, why am I going to eat? Why am I going to eat this thought that there's something wrong with me, that I'm less this, less that, I need to be more this? Why am I going to beat myself up with a thought? So self-care means I won't allow myself to have those thoughts, but I'll have thoughts which are more kind and compassionate. What's a kind thought? Okay, I'm like this, but I'm okay. I'm still a good person. I'm a decent human being. I'm trying to be a good devotee. That's a more compassionate thought, isn't it? And one of the ways you can kind of, let's say, phrase your thinking is, imagine if the way you were dealing with yourself was the way you were dealing with somebody else then you would realize, wow, that's not very nice. You know, think of the things you say to yourself and imagine saying them to another person and imagine them saying, to a, saying that to a five-year-old kid. You, you might be arrested by the police for saying those things, right? You're so stupid, you'll never become anything. You're useless, why even try, you know? And you're saying that to a five-year-old kid and people are saying, you can't say that to that kid, you're destroying his life, right? And now we're saying that to ourselves. Isn't that amazing, right? So self-compassion, just like you eat a healthy food, you eat healthy thoughts. You say things, you think things which are healthy because you're preserving yourself, you're caring for yourself. So this is, this is an interesting thing to ask, to ask ourselves, why would I do something if it's not good for me? Why would I allow myself to say these things? Okay, there is a reason, there are many reasons, and one of them is because those things have been said to you a lot, and now they're in your tape recorder. And so you just hit the play button and it's going, you're not this, you're not that, you should be more this, you should be more that. Because you've heard it grossly or subtly, it's all over the media and advertising, right? You know, when you look at clothes, Who's wearing the clothes? Someone way more beautiful or handsome than you. That makes you feel like, hey, there's something wrong with me, right? That guy wearing that sweater, he's got bigger muscles than I do, right? He's got a nicer beard and a nicer tattoo than I do. That means something's wrong with me. That girl modeling, she's got a better figure than I do. No, she doesn't, that was Photoshop. But anyway, 
She's got a better figure. You know, models, models say things like, I wish I looked as good as I look in, I wish I looked in real life like I looked on the cover of that magazine, because I don't, right? So, um, so we are being told, isn't it a fact? We're being told something's wrong with us every time you look at the picture of a model, isn't it? Or every time you, you go to Brit, Britain Has Talent or whatever and you hear the 16-year-old singing a song like, oh my God, did they descend from Gandharva Loka? And, you know, and then you feel like, I'm never going to sing again. You know, there's like, there's, you know. Or you, you see that video of that 13-year-old like Indian genius kid who's, you know, who's pontificating on all kinds of social and political problems. You can't even understand what he's saying and he's like 13 years old and you're thinking, oh my God, I'm so stupid. Um, it's being programmed in there. It's not like people have to tell you that. It's just coming. But it's all about how you process it. And if you process it with self-love, then you're okay. Then you're like, oh, this is just how I am, you know? Maybe I can't sing, but I can dance. I'm a really good dancer. So, you know, what am I supposed to do? Kill myself over the fact I can't sing? No, just dance. Doesn't matter. Just dance your heart out, right? Or, Maybe I'm not good in English, but I'm good in math. Okay, well, don't write any novels, you know, go solve some problem, mathematical problems. So, um, this is how we get ourselves in trouble. We are allowing all these things to influence us. They're coming in, they're programmed in there, and we often don't realize it and we don't do anything about it. So, what I wanted to do in this lecture is, is just to make you realize your programming. And, and start to see it and start to compassionately deal with it and reprogram it that, to the point like, I'm okay as I am. And of course I can be better, but don't make judgments on it because when you make judgments on it, you'll destroy yourself. That's where you destroy yourself, on your judgments. Does that make sense? And the last point, and then we'll take questions is, it was a point I made earlier, if you're in a situation where you're, you default to extreme areas of low self-esteem where like if people don't praise you, you end up hating them because you're so needy of being praised or people don't tell you you're, you're doing a good job but they try to give you ins instruction and you're like, don't tell me, don't tell me I'll do it. These are all signs of your self-esteem has hit a level where, where it's critical, where it's causing problems in relationships. You ever see that? You ever tell somebody, you know, I think you could do it this way, and they run off and slam the door and, st you know, start crying? That is low self-esteem at a serious pathological level. So that's where it gets dangerous, where we can't function normally, and we have all these expectations for people to act in certain ways and not act in other ways, and um, we're going to have all kinds of problems with people. We'll have all kinds of problems in relationships. So when it gets to that level, then you need professional help. If it gets to that level that I, I just feel totally unworthy, there's no reason to do anything and so forth, then, then that's where it's a problem. And that's, that should seriously be dealt with. These other ones, I think you can work yourself around slowly, slowly, and um, you can read books on the topic. Um, uh, you can, uh, sometimes you can do reprogramming through hypnotism if you have really deep samskaras. I'm worthy, I'm useless, it can be reprogrammed to I'm a value, I'm lovable, I am worthy. So these are things to consider. This is only an hour, so we can only kind of scrape the surface, but it's something, I just wanted to give you something to think about. And now we'll go to questions. How do we want to do the questions? Uh, so I have a number of questions, Prabhu, which have been sent to me anonymously. Um, okay. If I can read them out to you if you'd like. Um, the first question I have that's sent to me says, when people newly take up Krishna consciousness, we notice that people think being humble means to act a certain way, such as saying, please accept my humble obeisances or acting timid instead of actually humble. How do we best understand the difference between this and developing real humility? Humility is a, is, is a realization that um, whatever good you find in me is a gift from Krishna, and I'm totally aware of that. 
I'm totally aware of my defects. I don't try to hide them from myself or others. And I am totally dependent on Krishna in everything I do. That's the basic definition of humility. And unfortunately, and I know this sounds funny, and I don't mean it to be funny, but it is funny. Unfortunately, sometimes we, humili we use humility, maybe unconsciously, as a means to get recognition mm. as a humble devotee. Like, or it means to get recognition as a proper devotee. Like, like what you're saying, what they're saying is like, if in the Sangha I behave humbly, people will think, oh, you're a good devotee or you're, you're, you're a nice person or something. So I'm, I'm using that to get recognition because, again, I, I'm not giving that recognition to myself. I'm, I'm judging myself as, as a bad person. I need to get the recognition of others. So I behave in a way to get their recognition. And sometimes we do that with our spiritual masters. We want to get their recognition. And what if we don't get it? Then, no, I've got to get a new spiritual master who gives more recognition, you know. Um, so, you know, these things are subtle, but we need to be aware of them because they definitely get in the way. Did that answer the question or we want, you want more? <laughs> um, they messaged and said that that did answer the question and thank you very much, Prabhu. Yeah, yeah. Um, the next question we have says, how can we stop putting people on a pedestal slash why do we do this? Stop putting people on a pedestal? Yeah. And why do, like, um, There could be many reasons why we do it. Um, I would ask the person who asked, why do they think they're doing it? And then we can, at, when we can discuss how to not do it. Because I, um, you know, it could come from low self-esteem also because we don't recognize ourselves. And we recognize everyone else is great except ourselves. And, um, it, it actually, like sometimes when you, here's a pathology, you have low self-esteem, you'll do things to lower your self-esteem because it's your comfort zone. And so sometimes putting people on a pes, pes, pedestal can do that. It can, it can knock you down more. Because if you feel bad, unworthy, you'll knock yourself down more because that's, that makes you feel good to knock yourself down. Does that make sense? It's, yeah. It's like, it's, like, it's, like, it's like when people have a problem with self-forgiveness, the reason they can't forgive themselves is they don't think they're worthy of self-forgiveness. Is they think that, well, they feel guilty to forgive themselves. So it's just like this vicious cycle. So um, that could be a reason. Um, it almost like you want you want to make someone better to make yourself feel worse because that's where you feel most comfortable feeling worse because you're so used to feeling bad about yourself that it's become a pathological comfort zone. That could be one reason, but did he, did he give another reason or she? Uh, no, the so that was just their question, I think. Yeah. Um, um, but yeah, I think it, what you said probably about reflecting on why we, we put people on a pedestal, I think that was um, a really great point to make. In terms so you, of can all, you can all do that. <laughs> um, there could be good reasons also, not bad reasons, you know, because you, you want to be like that person. And if you serve a person, you become like them. So it could be good reasons also. Definitely. Thank you, Prabhu. Um, the next question says, if I need to learn new skills for work or other projects, and this is affecting my self-esteem because it's difficult, how can I go about um, doing this knowing it needs to be done? Yeah, here's the mantra. Every master was first a disaster. You see, the thing is, um, that's why reading biographies are good because you know, you you just see the end result. Okay, here's Steve Jobs or here's whoever, right? But then you read the story, you go, yeah, he failed so many times, and you know. 
You know this book, Chicken Soup of the Soul, bad title, but um, it was rejected by 130 publishers. Somehow or other, you know, he had faith it was a good book. And it was one of the biggest selling books ever. So, um, do you know that it takes on the average three years for a business to become successful? And most people give up because they don't know it takes three years. And they go, oh, I'm a failure, you know, I can't develop this business. It's six months and nothing. No, it takes three years to really get it going. So it's, it's good to understand that successful people had to start somewhere and learn and make all kinds of mistakes. In fact, I've heard people say, you should make as many mistakes as you can as quickly as possible. Because that's how you learn. You learn by making mistakes. So, I lost track of what I was saying. Anyway, what was the question? Uh, it was about learning new skills and yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. how it affects um, your self-esteem. Yeah. And also, we've all been endowed with a certain degree of ability and intelligence. And so we're all going to be better or worse at certain things. But that, the point, the point we want to understand is don't equate your material abilities to your core sense of who you are and your core sense of who you are in Krishna's eyes as a, as a being worthy of his love and his service. And worthy of, the, when worthy of the love and friendship of your friends, family, and so forth. That's where you get totally messed up. You're, you know, and that's where we have the problem. So, you know, okay. You're learning something you're not good at. I, <laughs> my daughter took a statistics class. It was hell on steroids for her, for sure. She was going crazy. She goes, I hate this, I hate this, I hate this. So we got a tutor. She was like, okay, I can't do this without a tutor. And then she goes to take the exam. I go, how did you do it? She goes, I have no idea. Blah, blah. She got a 99 on the exam. So you know, it's, it's, it's like that, you know? You think you're something, and you beat yourself up about it, and look at, you know? Did that ever happen to you? Like you're like depressed for days. If he's like, I must have failed my test, or, you know? Or they wrote, someone says, I have a letter I'm sending you in three days. And you're like, oh, they're going to fire me and this and that. And you open the letter and you've just been promoted for your work. You know? so, but, but the point is, even if they fire you, can, do you have to say, there's something wrong with me because I was fired? Can you say, okay, this, a, these, this company is really unfortunate that they fired me. I'm just going to work for another company and make them fortunate. Could you say that humbly? You could, right? So, I have a friend. Some of you may know him. His name is Hovi Das. Um, and years ago, I don't know, maybe five years ago, he moved to Alachua. And then a few years ago, he moved like very close to me. And then we worked um, together on doing a new Brahma Samhita, a new version of Brahma Samhita. And um, so I was kind of engineering, and he was playing, and I was watching him. You know how he's doing it. And, and he would say, you know, okay, give me an instrument. And we'd find the right instrument. And he goes, okay, start recording. I go, well, you don't want to practice playing something? Because that's what I would do. He goes, no, I hear it in my head. I'll just play it. I'm like, okay. <laughs> so I'm watching him do it. And, you know, in comparison to him, I'm like, as a musician, I was like, you know, I have to go in my bedroom and cry, you know, oh, you know. So, what does that mean? Okay, I'm making a public announcement. I'm never singing again. I'm not doing kirtan again. It's just like, I can't, you know, it doesn't make any sense, right? Can I, you know, sing for Krishna even though I, and play for Krishna even though I can't play like that? Of course I can. So why not celebrate, you know, whatever you have and can do? And do it in devotion. That's what matters, right? Okay, we have two minutes. Then I have to run. <laughs> Prabhu, I think we will let you go. We have a lot of questions left, but I'm hoping that we might be able to get you back one day um, mm -hmm. and we could probably do a question and answer session instead. Um, okay. 
You can yeah. also you can also send those questions to Jai Rate, and I can give uh, voice note answers. Perfect. We can um, do we can do both, but as a intermediate step, because yeah. usually what happens is um, talks like this just kind of open things up. You know, we're like, oh, okay. So uh, it's good. Yeah, I think we should do a second session. That would be good to you know. Yeah, definitely. Well, lots of people in the chat are already requesting for a second session as well. Yeah, so. because yeah, you need more time. And uh, also, um, if Jai Rade is here, yeah, if you could find Jai Rade where I see, I'm, I, I have SoundCloud, and I gave a whole series of lectures on low self-esteem. It's on my SoundCloud, so Mahatma Das SoundCloud, and then I forget the title. Maybe called Self Compassion, Self Envy, something like that. Uh, Okay. okay, I'm going to go to the next. Perfect. Thank you so Zoom. much, Prabhu. We really appreciate your time. Um, uh, and thank you so much. Hopefully we can have you back as soon as yeah. we can. My pleasure. Hare Krishna. Nice um, to see you all. <laughs> lovely to see you too. Um, just before everybody heads off tonight, I'd also really like to say a big thank you to all of you who joined today and for your really amazing questions. I'm really sorry that we weren't able to get through all of them. Um, but like I said, fingers crossed that we can get Mahatma Prabhu back again. Um, if you do want to access any more of Mahatma Prabhu's content, please see the links in our chat box. Um, I think we have a link to a SoundCloud on there um, and also his Instagram because he makes uh, regular content on there, which um, I know at least for me is quite inspiring in my day to day life. I um, mean, it's, it's a really uh, it's some really good daily meditations as well. Um, I have a number of events to announce which are coming up. Um, so this is our March schedule. So the 6th of March tomorrow night, P Sangha is hosting a Sri Ishopanishad P Sangha quiz night. I think I already said that. Um, if you would like to join, um, please check out um, our Instagram for more uh, details. On the 7th of March, we are having a really amazing talk with um, Sutapa Prabhu and it's all to do with Goranga. The Chaitanya Charitamrita and us. Um, it's a big lead up to Gorpunim. So please, please join us for that. Um, and on the 14th of March, we will be having His Holiness Lokanath Swami, and he'll be talking to us about spirituality and the youth. So um, a whole list of amazing um, speakers coming up. So please, if you would like to know any more um, information about this, follow us on Instagram. Um, message us um, and we will let you know all of the details. Um, just going to check with the team. Is there anything else? Nope. We all good, everybody? Perfect. Thank you all so much um, for tonight. Um, stay safe and hopefully we'll see you for our next event. Hare Krishna.